so welcome. Um, this is the, the release pipeline in practice. Uh, graduating from the s s s school of Michael Green. Um, his name will come up a little bit, so I've put it here. Uh, so my name is Matt. I'm a, a senior consultant. Um, I'm kind of walking the line of a PFE now as well. I kind of dabble into both roles. Um, I'm uh, based in Asia and I primarily uh, work on um, data center management projects. Um, I'm a former PowerShell MVP as well, uh, which kind of led me there. And over the last really uh, year or two years, I've been working on a lot of uh, configuration management projects. Um, and so this is uh, really kind of uh, talking about um, the learnings I've gained from that. So a little about what we are going to cover today. We are going to talk a little about what the release pipeline actually is, um, how it works, and then I'll give you a bit of a demo and a reference architecture I'm working on as well. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little about um, a project I'm working on now uh, with a major financial firm where we are putting in um, an approach to managing a private cloud um, as code. Um, so that's really the intention of uh, today. If you think you may be in the wrong place, here is what I'll cover. Um, you're welcome to kind of think, oh, never mind, I'll go elsewhere and watch it later. Um, so now is your chance to leave, otherwise hang around and um, I'm sure you'll learn something. Um, just a quick uh, talk about the outline as well. Uh, so the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. That happened when I wrote this. So this is the initial outline for my talk. Um, that was written towards the end of last year when and coming here was a really good idea and I thought, yeah, yeah, um, I'm working on this project and when, and when PS Comp rolls around, everything will be done and all I need to do is turn up and uh, talk about how amazing everything is. That's not actually true. Um, yeah, not really. Uh, it turns out you're never really done. Um, this is a very kind of transformational thing, right? Which means that it's not the easiest thing to do. So I need to just change the uh, tent a little bit. So we'll talk about what I'm working on rather than what I've worked on, um, where we are right now rather than how we got to the end, um, and some uh, cultural challenges that we continue to be working through. So that's uh, the overview. So how many people know what the release pipe line actually is? Who's had that term? Everybody. Great. Um, so that actually saves a little bit of time here then. Who's read uh, the Michael Green white paper on a release of pipeline model? Okay. Awesome. And who's actually tried his uh, demo CI project? A few people. Okay, cool. Um, so overall, a release pipeline is a process or a workflow that will take our code from um, from being code uh, through tests and then into working. 
into Pro. Um, it's usually a developer way of working, of course. Um, but now that the, we're moving more to sort of in Pro as code, it really becomes more and more important to operations people as well. And we've reached a point now as well where we have a lot of code running in prod. Um, that needs to be properly managed. Um, and we really need to put a proper wrapper around it. Oh, sorry, it's changed the wrong one. Sorry. It's okay. I'll win. So, um, so Michael Green, he wrote a paper um, that uh, came out around a year ago now that talks about how we as ops relate the uh, principles of the pipeline to what we do. Um, and those are around source, um, build, test, and release. And that and really kind of covered the high level thinking. Um, not as many people read that as I think should have, um, but he did then kind of uh, release a demo project as well onto GitHub, uh, the demo CI, and that aims to work with his pipeline model to help you kind of build a initial pipeline demo um, to kind of really get how everything works. And I use these as a way to um, as a way to convince the team I'm working with that this was a good approach for them with their private cloud. I'm sure I turned Twitter off, but never mind. So those are the two are the two things. So I used them to kind of demo the whole thing to the team I'm working with, um, kind of saying, "Look, we need to be doing this. We can't run a cloud by kind of." A hand, hand uh, cranking changes and that kind of thing. If we have any kind of downtime, um, it's not going to go so well. So they're kind of saying, okay, yeah, very, very happy with this. Um, but we seem to have some knowledge gaps as well. And it felt a little like this. So they had the high level of how to do this. They had a detailed uh, demo using TFS and that kind of thing um, in which we just kind of built um, a little web farm kind of thing. Uh, very, very basic. Um, but when we talked about how to actually implement this into an enterprise and run it in an enterprise, it sort of seemed like there were a number of things that we didn't know how how to do. Um, we didn't know actually which components we would need to use, uh, which uh, tools, which kind of version control, how to manage modules, how to make or code is getting the right tests, all of that kind of thing to make it kind of uh, enterprise grade. So the challenge to me was to fill in the blanks. And I couldn't really have a, a ref a rent to that until I had a architecture to work with. Um, so that was what I needed to kind of work on first. It really, it's really hard not having my presenter view up because I don't know what's coming next. Um, give me a second. 
Yeah, I will need to wing this. I'm sorry. How's this? Oh, hang on. Is it down here? Okay. Um, should hang it. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, nerves are really cloudy sometimes, so. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, the challenge was coming up with the architecture. And having never worked on this kind of project before, we never really knew how how and to do it. Um, but the more I thought about it, I had eventually what I call my uh, Miyagi moment. I'm guessing everybody knows the Karate Kid, right? Yeah. yeah. So geeky guy, um, Daniel, he's um, wanting to learn Karate, so he's doing all this kind of hard work. Um, getting a little bit annoyed about kind of wax on, wax off and that kind of thing. And I realized, you know, it's not too um, different to what we have been doing over the years for this guy. <laughs> We've been learning about how to write tools and uh, modules and how to do um, scripting um, and in recent years about PS gallery and about uh, package management and pools servers and moth files and actually we probably have everything that we need maybe we do know karate or DevOps already and all that we need is someone to kind of kick our ass in a way where it actually pulls it all out of us. And so that's how I kind of uh, sat and came up with this, which is my reference architecture and kind of work in progress for um, how to do a more kind of enterprise ready um, in for uh, as code implementation. Um, I'm not sure whether the colors um, make it a little bit hard to read or if it's okay. Yeah, this is not released yet. It's um, something that we're working on. But um, I thought if you take all of the pillars across the top and then if you think uh, we're going to use TFS to then and deliver this. In TFS, we've got uh, different uh, work areas, code and work, for managing our code and work. Um, build, for running our builds of any code, uh, doing our unit tests, and that kind of thing. Um, and then onto uh, releases, which actually takes care of deploying into our environments and of running our tests as we release our code as well. Um, and it can do all of that. It can release onto either hardware nodes, onto VMs, onto cloud platforms as well um, by just adding more code. Um, anything 
we need to think about in terms of of automating requests for privileges or changes we can do as well um, and everything eventually comes from the pool server and that will take all of its uh, content from the package management solution and that is loaded from another release process which comes from a dedicated artifacts repo and that is built up by us which we now term um, infra dev engineers so when we laid it all out like that it made a lot of sense so oh, okay so we can demo that <laughs> <clears throat> okay. My mouse is not working anymore. So I'm going to switch over to this side. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't come again uh, next year. Okay. Okay, so this is a so this is a um, a working implementation which is based on the project I'm doing. I can't actually show you that, so I had to kind of um, create a a demo working lab. Um, so the way that the release pipeline that we have works um, is that we have our code repo. Um, all of this I'll delve into next. But that is hooked up to a build uh, definition which has a bunch of uh, variables, but there's really not that much to what it actually does. It's just uh, running the code we had defined back here. Um, that then, uh, supporting that, we have our uh, release, which has a number of environments defined. Um, and that's not actually really doing too much either just kind of running some code and then loading xml into tfs um, but these environments are how we can kind of um, um, break up what we are going to kind of deploy onto so here i've got four uh, a test um, pilot wider test uh, a prod pilot and prod and all of these have some uh, variables attached which the code uses to uh, work out what to do. Um, try not to worry about that too much. I've got another talk about that. Yep, sure. Um, how's that? Okay. So. So yeah, I do have a talk later this week about how to manage uh, creds as well. Um, but pretty much everything comes from the code. So when we're running a release, 
we're really only initiating a script over here, which is a task sequence. But if we look at our code repo, um, I break it down as to how everything works. Um, we've got our uh, environment data files. These contain everything about the particular environment we're going to deploy into. So any nodes in there, any computer names, any IPs, um, everything related to that particular environment. We then separate out anything um, settings related. In this case, I only have one, but we would kind of arrange everything um, that the nodes across every environment have in common, all in here. So roles, features, um, reg keys, uh, files, apps, anything else. As long as it's common, we'll, yeah, we'll keep it here. And then we define our DSC by having um, input parameters so we can feed in the data from here. The node data comes in as a variable um, config data. And then everything that we actually define, we're pulling from the input. So that will make this a lot uh, more dynamic and easier to maintain. So when we want to add another role or change anything, um, we would add it here rather than changing the, the main config. We also then have our tests. Um, we have our unit tests, um, which are run when we run a build, and those are there really to make sure that we're not doing anything wrong in in these. So we haven't overlapped IP addresses, we haven't overlapped uh, uh, computer names. Um, we're not going to compile any kind of moth file that could cause us a problem later uh, when we go and uh, deploy that. Um, we and that is pulling data from here as well. Uh, we're doing tests on these. We have our integration tests which run during the um, deployment and that's oops, again going to work out uh, which other nodes we need to test uh, the data coming from here and um, what is it that we actually need to test and that is coming from from here again um, and then X that tunes uh, test a last um, again pulling our node uh, data from here. So I just pick up a quick um, build and release of the environment that is working already. Hopefully you can see this. Now this is really only running our script over here. So this is done entirely in PowerShell. It will just um, run through these tasks, uh, run our tests, and then upload the, the data as XML into TFS, where we can 
see that. Uh, see that there for all environments, hopefully. If I can zoom out a little bit. And now that we have a build, um, we can go ahead and release that. And uh, I have it uh, lined up to release into each environment provided it passes. So we'll go ahead and take that off. And that is going to execute the build script that we've got sorry, deploy in our repo. So we're going to, um, there's a task here uh, which is a placeholder task, uh, not working yet, but um, we're going to go ahead and work out which is the environment that we're deploying into. We're going to uh, grab the nodes, and you saw there uh, two nodes. We'll reach out to those um, and make sh sure they're connected to the pool server, and we'll push out their mops and then tell them to go and uh, download it. Anything it will need in terms of uh, modules it will take from the pool server as well. Um, the magic here around how it works out what it, it needs is the environment name. It will just uh, marry that up to this and it will know which nodes to, to go with. Um, <clears throat> so that will take a little time, but while that happens, um, one of the things happening here, I need to clean up how, how this looks, but we wanted to have a way to, to kind of contact each node uh, in a certain order, tell it to pull, and then apply its moth. But we had a problem where there was no real way to work out um, when that completed and, and when to kick off the tests. And so this is just some code which kind of monitors every node. Um, are they done yet? Are they done yet? And when they are, we'll carry on and kick off the tests. And the tests are running over WinRM. Um, all that we're, we're doing there is looking at our environment data uh, for the node names, and then um, setting up a remote session, and then running our tests against each each node. Um, in this case, I'm just kind of reading out of here about what are the roles it should have, and should it be there or not, and then running a test which validates that. So really everything is is coming from these and that then will make it very, very easy to maintain. 
I should probably not have released it to multiple environments, only to one first, because this will take about 12 minutes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, in the release, we can have rules um, in the release definition for when to deploy into each environment. So here, the test, I've got it. If we pass in pilot, then do test. And in um, prod pilot, it's if we pass in test, then do this one. Um, so yeah, you can control when that happens. And you can add approval levels as well, if you need to. Um, but really, the beauty of how all of this works is everything's in code. And it's really only using TFS to kind of tee off the, of the code and then to show you the test results. Why I really like that is it means that this can be moved across any tool. Any tool you can run PowerShell with. So you're not going to be in tied deep into TFS. If you want to be and you want to pay for it, um, thank you very much and continue to do that. But if you kind of think, yeah, we've been using TFS, um, but now we want to go here or there, you can, and it's very, very easy to move rather than having to work out, okay, we have all these tests in, say, Jenkins. How would I move all of that into my next tool? And how much work is that? Um, and that happened on my project. We had... Um, um, a guy joined to help, he was very, very Jenkins mad. So he kind of set up this in Jenkins. And he was saying, it's all wizards, uh, very, very easy, you do this and that. And I said, yeah, but now you're locked in to it. And he realized, ah, oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're not pushing. Yeah, yeah, we're going to the nodes and we're making sure that they know um, where to pull from and which moth uh, to pull because uh, we're using config names as well rather than GUIs. So we're just kind of making sure they know what it is they need to do and then they go off and do it. Um, if you think... We did, it's not easy to use, it's not as flexible as you would want, and it's easier to just uh, manage the, the node. So, yes, so we're doing that, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, okay, so that is, is where we are. Like we talked about lock-in, um, yeah, by managing this in code, you're not then locked into the one tool, and that's um, really good. So essentially, uh, and I may just kill this release, just to... Let's, 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 
seven. Mm -hmm. I should stop the next one. Here. And go into Yeah, correct. Yeah, so that shouldn't happen. But um, if we have a look at what actually completed, um, we've got two environments where we run our tests. And we collect all of that into TFS um, in a nice kind of viewable uh, panel. And that is uh, captured into XML as well. So if you wanted to then convert that into like uh, a nice email to send out, it's easy to do also. Yeah. So in terms of changes as well, I mean, it's, um, it's pretty simple then to make a change. Uh, shall we go ahead for some live coding? That always works, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. So at the moment I've got um, that I want to have my web server as absent, but maybe now I'll, I'll change it to present so that will add TFS. But I also want to add, uh, sorry, that will add IIS. But I also want to add uh, something else, uh, multipath IO. This one's a little demo um, risky because it needs a reboot and I don't know how this will go, but we're going to wing it anyway. Um, when I add this initially, I'm choosing absent. And the reason is I know that it's not there already. Right? Um, we found that when you want to manage anything new, the easiest way to do it and to make sure that you have a way to roll back as well is add it in into the moth first without making any change. Once you've had a release of a moth containing the current setting which hasn't changed the node, when you actually change it next, you have a way to roll back and to remove it as well. And that's worked out really, really well for us. Rather than just kind of going, um, yeah, and add IIS, add a patch here, add a patch there, because then if anything goes wrong, you need to work out, okay, now how do I remove the patch? So if this worked out to be a really, really good um, thing to do. And uh, I'll uh, just go ahead and up date my acceptance test as well. Um, let's do some coding in the spot. Yeah, so we can say that. Code, the value should rather than be, that should probably be a 200, which is okay, right? So for each connection, we're going to do a web request, a port 80, yeah, what can go wrong? It should just be that simple, right? Okay. <laughs> so, we've added in a new role, a feature, we've changed our IIS, and we'll just uh, go ahead and add it. So we're now going to deploy one change and bring a new feature into management on 
eight nodes, and I haven't used RDP yet. Which is pretty cool, right? Okay. Just the demos launch there. Off we go. <coughs> So this assumes that the servers are already there, um, whether that's a VM, hardware, whatever. Um, we do have, um, well, we have two scenarios really where we're kind of doing this. One is with nodes where we know what they are. Um, so we'll know their names, IPs, all of that kind of thing. The other is for new VM provisioning, where we don't actually know what the VMs are. Um, it's really only a one-time run of the MOF file, um, and we don't really uh, care about uh, managing changes to it. Um, a a scenario where that happens is when developers request IIS or app uh, servers and that kind of thing. So in that scenario, the release will go that we will create a new temporary VM on the um, uh, Windows Azure Pack cloud. We'll um, push the moth onto that. We'll test against it, and if the tests pass, we'll then release the moth onto the pool server, where anyone can kind of pull it by now, because we know that works. Um, yeah, so that's the other one. Yes, and I referenced that a little bit in my talk later this week. It's not something that's easy to do, and I don't really like it very much. No, no, no. Um, in short, in short, though, for that, um, the. The way that we're trialing at the moment is having a common certificate added to the to the VM during the build, and that is used. At the moment in this uh, pilot, yes. That's not really a kind of enterprise kind of practical way to do it, and everybody will cry about the risks and that kind of thing. Um, but the challenge is it's also hard to manage, so you need to find a good kind of middle ground for it. Yeah, and that is hard. Okay, and so the... Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry. Good. I couldn't hear that one. Sorry. Right, okay, yeah. So I'll just answer that one quickly by going back to the diagram. So what we have is a artifact repo which contains everything we would need to use um, any resources, any any modules, 
uh, and that kind of thing. Um, this then has its own release process, and the release for these is that we'll test it with PS Analyzer, or do any mocking tests, and that kind of thing. But uh, the goal of uh, releasing these are that they then end up on the gallery server. <clears throat> Not sure if you're using the PS private gallery. Um, we're trialing that out. It's having it. It it's not amazing yet. Um, needs a little work, but overall, we um, the, the goal is to load everything onto the gallery, and then everything propagates out from there. So the pool server runs a regular task to pull down any modules to provide to clients, and then. Anyone working on code here, rather than taking any modules from GitHub to use, they would take them from here. If there's a module not there that is on GitHub that they need, they need to add it to the repo, and that will then go through a release and land here for them to use. Scheduled task and the PowerShell script. Yeah. 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 Every hour. Yeah, so that's that. Yeah, okay. Shoot. Yes. I have a talk on that later this week on Friday. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we take, for example, the uh, the virtualization solution we're doing. We're managing Hyper-V and VMM in this way. So in terms of environments, um, that is really where these come in. Um, having kind of like a, a test um, pilot, and then pilot, and, um, and then prod. And those are chosen really kind of based on lowest risk. So tests, the test of pilot hosts will be in the test lab with um, very little to no load. So we can then deploy to those and test knowing we have very little risk of kind of breaking things. And if they pass, then we can move on to the wider kind of test hosts, knowing they're really only running test workloads. Yeah. 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 Right. Oh. Yeah. But, yeah. No. That that is actually working as a part of uh, the pipeline. So within the deploy script. So, let me switch 
back to you. Let me just switch over to the external Sorry, duplicate. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So as a part of the deploy script, there's a task in there which will read in the nodes from the environment file. Um, figure execution and then that will just reach out to the node, log in and then set up the LCM by generating a meta moth containing the computer name and then running that and that's it. Then it's hooked in and good to go. Okay. Sure. I'm out of time. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. I wanted to talk about that today. I've been trialing it for a little while. It's, it's actually quite hard uh, to manage as well. So I needed to remove that. But uh, the variables are there for when I work out actually how to do it. So um, I'm out of my main time. Okay, so I'm out of that. If you have any more techie questions, I can take those offline. Um, I got a little bit sidetracked there, and I kind of missed the um, uh, the kind of important uh, bit I wanted to kind of wrap up with. Um, which really talks about the challenges oh, okay. that uh, really talk about the challenges we ran into with this that weren't so much uh, technical problems, although there were a few. Um, we so when we took Michael Green's uh, demo project and then and kind of wanted to make that um, enterprise ready we ran into challenges around things like uh, how to manage uh, credentials, um, how to hook up the nodes to the L's, to the pool server and that kind of thing. Um, ran into a lot of environmental issues along the way as well. When you're working on a pot in a lab as well, uh, people tend to take your hosts and use them for other things and then you need to get storage reallocated, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so those could have been kind of worked around and for some planning. But um, we ran into some challenges around uh, DSC resources as well. While there is a huge amount out there, there is a big uh, gap as well. So we needed to create a number of internal ones. Whether we'll end up uh, releasing those, I'm not sure. But um, we had to kind of put a lot of time into building base code. Um, the locked down. Um, Desktop is an interesting one because um, now that we're working like developers, you need to be downloading packages and running code and that kind of thing. And it's then that you learn just how locked your desktop is. Um, one of my roles in a past life was making sure end users were really secured, but I didn't realize how much uh, pain and hard work that actually caused for developers as well. And if anyone in, uh, in the room is a developer, I am so sorry for all of that pain. Um, um, and then of course you run into challenges with people as well, and it's not really around 
of people being hard work, it's that this actually takes a lot of work to change and there's a lot you need to learn, a lot you need to read up um, and if it's not getting at the right level of kind of prioritization then it will take more and more time, right? The project kind of drags on. Um, we're now 10 months in. I thought it would take no more than eight, but um, we carry on. And that's really kind of down to how people need to change how they work in order to properly uh, adopt this. Um, so if you wanted to have a quick look at the timeline of what we've actually done, I mean, that's it. That's a, the past 10 months of uh, my life, which, while it may not look like a huge amount, those are, are pretty uh, big wins. And if you're kind of working along as well and having these challenges, know that you're not alone and it seems like it's a normal thing um, because of, of the level of change involved and the amount of code that you need to write that you don't actually realize you need to write it until you're doing it. Um, so there's that. So a few points to wrap up. Um, the white paper and the demo project are a really, really good place to begin. There's a number of things you'll need to work out along the way. Um, if it and takes a little time, it is normal and you're not alone. Um, and you probably will have managers kind of saying, like, where's the the project plan and what have you achieved and where has your last 10 months gone and that kind of thing. Um, you will probably make a couple of people unhappy, um, but that's the, the nature of change, right? It's, it's hard to kind of predict and it's hard to know exactly where you need to go until you're on the journey and go in there. Um, and anything you're doing, know that Miyagi approved. Thank you very much.